Our call to worship today uh, comes from uh, Nelson Mandela. It is, your, it is in your hands to create a better world for all who live in it. Let's bow for a word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, as we come you, to you today, help us to acknowledge you and, and worship you and, and uh, put you um, in the forefront of our minds and our hearts, Lord, uh, and lift you up at this time. Uh, Lord, we just ask you to be with the, uh, uh, with the message today, uh, that the words uh, touch our hearts, and uh, to help us to know you in that personal and better, uh, uh, better way uh, in our lives. Help us to have our hearts open to you uh, today as we, we sing uh, for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand and sing hymn number uh, 634, Oh How I Love Jesus. this time we'll dismiss our children to children's church with Miss Pam. And most of you know that our offering plate is in the aisle here and uh, you can um, give uh, your offering as you uh, uh, at any time in the offering plate uh, uh, as you exit the church or, or come in uh, to the church. So at this time, let's uh, uh, offer a prayer of offering to, uh, for our giving. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can give to you uh, and give uh, not only our money, but our time and our energies of giving uh, to your cause, Lord, to lift you up uh, and to go out and help, seek those who need to hear the, the good word and to... Uh, Help those who are hurting and struggling at this time. Lord, we just ask you to bless this money uh, and uh, help us to use it wisely in everything that we do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, let's uh, continue in singing hymn number 314, What a Day That Will Be. Hymn number 314.
Please, let's go to the Lord, Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the joys that we have, the fellowship, um, um, the, the fact that you are involved and in, uh, care about us and are with us through our, our good times and our troubles, Lord. And we just ask you to be with those who are, are facing some issues at this time in their lives um, and to be with them and let them know that you are there alongside them and there's nothing to, um, that we truly have to be worried about if we can just trust in you, Lord, that, you, that you've got this. Uh, no matter what the outcome, Lord, you're with us and that we can rely upon you and know that uh, um, our heart's in the right place and that uh, uh, we can be guided by you and uh, have that uh, inner peace in our lives. Lord, we, I just ask you to be with uh, Beverly as she uh, deals with her issues um, and uh, lift her up. Also, just uh, joys, Lord, we thank you uh, for the fact that family can get together and, and reunite after a long period of time uh, and, uh, and share in that joy and excitement. Uh, Lord, we just ask you to be with our church family, help us to grow in, uh, in the knowledge of you and uh, in our relationship with you, Lord, um, as we continue through uh, uh, these times. Lord, we know that troubles have always been uh, with people throughout history, and this is really nothing new. And, but we can look and see how our forefathers uh, dealt with it by uh, trusting in you and relying on you and how they got through the hard times in their lives. And, uh, and we can know that we can do that as well uh, by being with you. Lord, just guide us and direct us throughout this week. Uh, let, help us to uh, be in tune with you and the Holy Spirit to be active in our lives as we um, um, go about our lives this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, at this time, I believe I'm going to turn it over to uh, William. And uh, thank you for coming. And Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Excited to hear about you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Good morning, nice to see all of you today, and good to meet many of you, and I'm delighted to be here. I, I guess um, our family has known your former pastor and his wife, John and Kelsey, for a number of years. Um, for about 12 years, I was the bivocational minister in Stonington, Illinois, and I have a counseling business up in uh, Springfield, and a couple years ago, we decided I wanted my daughter, Sharice, who's with me today, to um, go to the Sacred Heart Griffin High School. It's a good Christian school, and my, my, number of my Baptist friends had a little issue. They said, well, aren't they Catholic? I said, yeah, last time I checked, Catholics are Christians. <laughs> so so she, gets, she gets Bible and theology classes every day, plus it's a very good school. And so, so I resigned at Stonington, and we've moved to Springfield. We live in Springfield now, and, and I'm delighted to be with you. And, but last summer, we had the opportunity. Uh, my daughter, we noticed that they were looking for a lifeguard at the church camp where John and Kelsey are now. And so, so Sheree supplied and got the lifeguard position. And, of course, she goes to camp there. And uh, so she went to camp. She was also a lifeguard. And then they asked her last year, they had someone cancel at the last minute if she could stay in council for the junior high camp. And I believe that you saw a good recent friend here. There, for, that, was, that was at the junior. So it was nice we came because, yeah, my, my, da my daughter was like, I don't know if I'll know anybody. I said, well, you know, we'll see. So, so obviously, obviously we're glad to see friendly faces when we walk in the door and, and delighted to be with you. I'm really impressed with your facility here. And I'd love your, your addition back there. That's beautiful. And I'm just delighted to be here. I grew up in a very small town in Missouri, much like Verdon. The only difference is Verdon's a little closer to an urban area than I was. Where I grew up, um, many people call it nowhere Paris, Missouri. Anyway, but, <laughs> but it's a little small town, and I grew up going to church and church camp there. And, and um, I'm, I'm reminded in doing this little pulpit supply when I first went to college, I was planning to go in the ministry when I went to college. And so we had these ministry classes, and after about your first year, the summer after your freshman year, they send you out in the summer to fill the pulpits of all these ministers who go on vacation. And this reminds me a lot of doing that, that first summer I did that. And, and um, I remember I got up and I was like that young minister got up the first sermon he's going to preach. And he's so excited. And he, he'd picked the feeding of the 5,000. He, he, he started out his sermon with great enthusiasm. He said, and Jesus fed 
seven people with 5,000 loaves of bread, you know, and everybody just roared laughing, you know. But this one guy in the front row, the whole sermon, every time he'd look up the young minister, he'd just start laughing, laughing. He just couldn't get it out of his head. He's laughing. And it really hurt, it really hurt the young minister. So the next week he went back and practiced, practiced, practiced. He came back next week and he was going to do it again. So he goes, and Jesus fed 5,000 people with seven loaves of bread. It went off great without a hitch. And he thought, well, I'm going to get a little revenge on this guy in the front row because he was sitting right there. And he says, sir, do you think you could do that? And the old man looked up and says, I could have had the bread left over from last week. <laughs> but it's a joy to be with you, and I'm, I'm delighted to be with you. And, and um, I'm actually going to be in the same passage of Scripture the first, these two weeks. They'll be identical. So if you have time this week to look it over, I, I think that might be beneficial. But I'll be in 2 Corinthians. And, um, and this is Paul writing, of course, the Apostle Paul, chapter 4. And it really is, is really worth reading from verse 1, but I'm going to start at verse 5 here, but this is one of those really, there's so many passages, especially in the New Testament, that are just so rich, you can spend a lot of time on, this is one of those passages where there's so much encouragement, there's so much encouragement for us as Christians, and I know sometimes, you know, we go along in our faith, and we begin to, you know, wonder, gosh, you know, how how am I going to make it, how are we doing in the church, and just a lot of, a lot of ways to get discouraged in our faith, but this is a passage of encouragement, a strong encouragement from the Apostle Paul. So starting at verse 5, For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars, earthen vessels, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. Now I'd like to continue reading what I'll also include next week just to prepare you for next week because it all fits together, but I'm only going to be preaching today on the verses up through verse 7. But reading on in verse 8, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. But just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with Scripture, I believe and so I spoke, we also believe and we also speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Thus ends the reading of the Scripture. I've been to your little high school out here before. I actually do some programs for schools, and I do the funny stuff. Some people, I'll go to churches, and I say, I've seen you somewhere. Well, what it is is I also do these hypnosis shows. You've seen them where you get people out of the crowd and have them do funny stuff. I did the State Fair in 2019, 33 shows in 10 days <laughs> in 90-plus degree heat. You know, so. But I've done North Mac High School. I did an assembly for them about three years ago. I did the Auburn after prom a few years ago. And we do these all over. Last night I did a little presentation show at a big golf club over by Hannibal, Missouri. It was somebody's 60th birthday party. We had a good time. and So I do that kind of thing. And um, I remember, you know, growing up in a small town, how these things can, can have an effect. And maybe here, like where I grew up, probably sports are a big deal. And it was a big deal where I grew up. Matter of fact, uh, it was a great privilege of mine growing up to get to play for a coach. He was an unusual gentleman. He came right out of college, he came to this little small town, and he just never left. He just never left. And what a great coach he was. I'm sure he had other offers, I'm sure he had other opportunities, but he took our little small town school to state many, many times, won lots and lots of games. His his wedding his winning record his entire 40 year career was 80%, which is amazing in a very small town because a lot of times, like the group I was in, the crop coming up. We were eager, but we weren't very tall. <laughs> As a matter of fact, my senior year, 
our team, our tallest player was 6'2", and he couldn't even touch the rim. And the rest of them were midgets like me. And, uh, but we knew, with his coaching, we knew if we could hold the other team down long enough and get to the last two minutes of the game, that our coaching, we'd win. And we often did. Paul is saying, I know it's hard. I know it's discouraging. I know life can be very difficult. Just becoming a Christian doesn't solve all of our problems. But if you can stay in the game, if you can keep your faith, the power comes not from ourselves. It comes from God. The power is in the gospel, in the good news. That's where the power comes from. So what if we don't have a lot of people here today? So what? You're here, I'm here, and most importantly, Jesus Christ said, wherever two or more are gathered my name, I will be there also. The Holy Spirit is here too. It is the power of God. You know, people often have a rough time. The load gets heavy to bear. Paul had a lot of rough times too. And when he writes to the church in Corinth, which was his problem church, his problem church in Corinth had all kinds of problems. When he writes to them, it's like you're listening to someone talking on the phone. And all you can hear is half of the conversation, the part you're standing there and that person talking on the phone. You don't hear the other conversation. And that's what's happening when we read the scripture. It's like we're hearing one half of the conversation. But from hearing just half the conversation, you often know what the other side of the conversation is, don't you? And you're listening to people talk. And that's what's going on in the scripture. There's a dialogue going on here. And this one-sided dialogue, it sounds like some of the people are questioning Paul's motives. It appears some of the good church members just don't like Paul. They just don't like Paul. Now, how could they not like the great apostle? This is one of the primary Christians in the Christian story. He's certainly the primary author of the New Testament other than the Gospels. This is the great theologian of Christianity, the one who wrote the book of Romans. Every great reformation of the church always was based on the book of Romans. This is the primary author, the primary theologian of the church, but some of the people in the church don't like Paul. Now, it shouldn't surprise us, because we've been to church, we've been in church a while, and, you know, have you ever noticed the sermons get better if you like the minister, if you like the preacher? Have you ever noticed that? The sermons get better, you know, and if you don't like the preacher, the sermons get worse. <laughs> Isn't that true? You know, Phillips Brooks, many, many years ago, one of the great, you know, princes of the pulpit, he often said, preaching is truth, is truth through personality. I've always remembered that because it's so true. If I like the preacher, I like their sermon. If I don't like the preacher, I don't really care for their sermon. And it's not just preachers, it's Christians. We all have a church that we preach to with our lives. The people you work with, your family, your friends, and you may not be preaching like I'm preaching right now, but your life is a sermon. And if they like you, and they respect you, and they admire you, that's the best sermon they'll ever hear. But by the same token, we've all heard it said about somebody, well, they go to church all the time, but I know what they're really like. And they're preaching a sermon too. They're preaching a sermon too, and because those people don't respect that person, they don't like that person, the truth is blocked by their personality. And Paul was so aware of that. And so he said, we do not preach ourselves. We do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ. Because ultimately, the best sermon is never about the person. It's about the Lord. It's about the power of the gospel. It's about the good news that can be in everyone's life through that message that Jesus died on the cross. 
He sacrificed out of his love for us. And because of that death on the cross and the resurrection, he is vindicated. And his message is vindicated. His gospel is truth. And we know that God loves us more than we can ever know. Now, you know, there are a lot of ministers, you know, and they greet people at the door and they'll come out and they'll say, you know, nice sermon, Reverend, nice sermon, Reverend, nice sermon. Then you get that one person, oh, that was the greatest sermon I ever heard. That was just so wonderful. And the minister goes, well, thank you, Mom. (laughs) We're always going to have those those kind of experiences. But we do not preach ourselves. That's the difference. You don't come to church to say, I go to church. I'm a deacon in the church. No, no, you're a deacon because it means servant. You're a deacon because it means servant. You're a church member because you want to serve God. It's not about us. It's not about us. We are the earthen vessels. We are the clay pots. We are these fragile, mortal beings that have been entrusted given the opportunity to carry that message, to carry that jewel, to carry that truth to those who need hearing it. I'm impressed with what I've seen here today. I, you, have a, you have a wonderful congregation. I think that's great. You have all kinds of ages. You're telling me about the different work you do with young people in the community. This is wonderful. This church is a vessel. When we join together and bring our messages together, we're more powerful. You know, right now we're wearing these. We're all afraid of catching the disease. But the truth is, in the faith, it's always been a matter of contagion. Because how do you catch faith? You can't teach faith. Faith is caught. Faith is caught. It's not taught. How do you become a Christian? By being around other Christians. That's why we gather on Sunday. That's why we gather on Wednesday nights. That's why we have events together. Because One person is encouraged, the other person is discouraged, and they pull the other person up. But the next Sunday, that person is encouraged, and that other person needs to be pulled back up. Faith is caught, not taught. Right now in the nursery, they are catching the faith. They may not even talk about God today. They may not even hear the the name Jesus, but they are being loved. And the gospel is love. They are being cared for. And that's what the church does. We care for each other. We take care. We pray for each other. We share our concerns, our burdens, our situations, our handicaps, our disappointments. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Now, I don't know. God's a little smarter than I am. I'm not sure I would have done it this way. I I think if I wanted to make sure the gospel got spread throughout the world, I probably, because I'm kind of simple-minded, I probably would put the angels in charge. Because, you know, know, they've got some extra powers we don't have. But it was God's will that used ordinary human people, sinful, damaged, handicapped human people, Why would he do that? Why would God do that? Well, at a different place in 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 26 through 29, Jesus, I mean, Paul said, For consider your call, brethren. Not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Think about it. Why did God choose Israel? If you were going to choose a tribe of people, would you have chose the Jewish people, those hard-headed, stubborn people? (laughs) Would you have chose the Jews? Oh my gosh, what a bunch. Every time God would do something wonderful like part the Red Sea so they could escape from Egypt, lead them out through the Exodus, what's the first thing they do? They make a golden calf. These are stubborn, hard-headed people. The Lord 
time and time again is having to bring them back from falling away from their faith. But they were the people God chose. Why would Jesus choose the disciples? You've got to admit, if we were holding applications and interviews for the disciples like we do ministers, none of them would have been hired. (laughs) None of them would have been hired. They were just such an ordinary bunch, weren't they? Fishermen? Fishermen? You got one tax collector, and we know what they thought about tax collectors, right? You know? Why did Jesus choose people like that? I remember when I went to seminary, they printed a, back then, a little like a yearbook, and, and it had all the pictures of the people in seminary. Well, the one I had, the cover got torn off, so you didn't know what school or anything about it, it just had all the pictures. And in my apartment, one of, the, one of the college kids in our church came by to see me, and he just picked it up, and he's looking through it, and he goes, uh, who, who are these people? They all look like prison convicts. And I said, oh, these, these are all the people who go to seminary. He goes, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> if God was choosing the worldly, the powerful, the impressive, most ministers would not make the grade. Isn't that true? They would not make the grade. But what minister touched your life? Somewhere, somewhere in your past, some minister touched your life. What minister touched your life? Were they really unusually gifted? Probably not. In my own life, I remember I was young. I was in junior high, and we got a new minister, and he was a dork. I mean, he, was, he had big black rim glasses, and he came out and tried to play basketball with us, and he couldn't even hit the backboard. I mean, he was, but he came out and played with us. You know, he came, so we kind of taught him how to play basketball and, and um, got to know him, and pretty soon... Started talking with the guy, and eventually he touched our lives. And that was very important. That's why I think church camp's so important. That's why youth group's so important. Somewhere, there's got to be that opportunity for a young person to be around someone of faith that they'll listen to. And he touched my life. We're still friends today. He's a retired minister down in Texas now. One time I was on a plane flying to an engagement, and I just happened to sit next to the president of Hannibal Grange University over in Hannibal. And um, that's a Southern Baptist school. And, and we were on this plane flying out somewhere in Texas. And, and um, I actually have a, a sister-in-law, my, my brother's wife, that uh, went to school there. And I said, you wouldn't happen to remember Pam. And I gave, his, gave her um, her maiden name. He goes, oh, I'll never forget Pam. I said, oh, really? I I thought, well, I'm going to get some dirt here. (laughs) He goes, you know, in chapel, the uh, students are encouraged to give testimonies. And a lot of students get up, and they talk about how bad their life had been with drugs or how bad their life had been in sex, and they go on and on about how bad they were. And at the end, they say, and then God saved me. He says, Pam got up to give her testimony, and her testimony wasn't like that. Pam got up and started with this line. He says, I'll never forget it. I'm not here to tell you about what I've done. I'm here to tell you about what God has done in my life. He says, I'll never forget that. We are earthen vessels. We are clay jars. The power is in the gospel. The power comes from God. Years later, I was reading a book, and you may, have, you may have read that book called The Hiding Place by Corey Tim Boom. She was a woman who, her family during World War II in the Netherlands helped hide Jews in their home. But unfortunately, during World War II, they were discovered by the Nazis, and, and they were imprisoned in a, in a concentration camp. And she actually lost all of her family members. She was the only one who survived the uh, concentration concentration camps and actually her release from the concentration camp was actually a clerical error she would have died there too but I think God gave her time so that she could tell the story 
And so she would go around Europe after World War II and she would give messages in churches and she would talk about the healing power of God and, and the healing power of forgiveness. Because the, 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 European, the European landscape had been just ravaged by all the hate and destruction of war. And afterwards, one of her messages, one man came up to her and says, what a wonderful Christian you are. What a wonderful Christian. She said, no. What a wonderful God I have. What a wonderful God. That is what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, don't look at me. Look beyond me. Look at the Lord. Look at God. Listen to the truth of the gospel because that's where the power comes from. The power comes from God. Now, I was pleased to see in your bulletin that every week there's an opportunity for prayer if someone wanted to come forward and confess their faith or if someone just had a, a concern, wanted prayer afterwards, that'd be fine. And if anybody has that feeling today, I'd be glad to pray with you. But why don't we join together in our closing hymn? And Janice, if you'll lead us there. Closing hymn 629, Only Trust Him. Let's go ahead and stand. for the benediction. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.